Welcome to Season 2 of the 360 Podcast, an all-around look at student-centered education. I'm Laura Gallant. And I'm Adrian Pumphrey. And today, for our first episode of this series, we talk with Dr. Robert Dillon, who is co-author of Space, uh, A Guide for Educators. Uh, we chat with him about educators' use of space, both inside and out, uh, and how it affects teaching and learning. Enjoy the episode. Well, uh, Dr. Robert Dillon, thank you so much for joining us on the 360 podcast. It's really good to have you with us. Yeah, it's great to be here, and uh, we're off to another school year, so it's uh, a lot of fun here in St. Louis, and I know uh, same for you guys there. Yeah. Um, I, thank you for writing this, this book. Uh, we've really enjoyed reading it, um, and there's lots and lots to think about. Um, I would just love to know a little bit more about the, the, the story that got you thinking about space, the spaces that we use in teaching and learning, and uh, yeah, what, you, what brought you to the point of, of writing this? Yeah, so the the space, a guide for educators, really was um, I don't ever never planned. It never was a part of the journey, but that's kind of I think how good learning takes place. Um, I was a principal at uh, Expeditionary Learning Middle School, so we were having kids outside, out in the community, outside of the community, twenty to twenty five percent of the school year. And I saw kids that were engaged and joyful and loving what was going on. And I realized that the disconnect between that and the classroom uh, was so stark. And I didn't know at the time that this is what we needed to do. Uh, And then I had a chance meeting with my co-author, and uh, we launched into this work uh, what now has been four or five years ago. What did your own sort of classroom look like in that space at the time? Yeah, for me, um, you know, it was pretty traditional, right? Like I wanted to, you know, I wanted kids to have movement. I was really into that piece and making sure that kids felt comfortable moving around the room because I'm that type of learner. Uh Uh, But I wasn't really thinking about what goes up on the walls and how we use natural light and really getting student feedback. And uh, I think that's all just grown into our process for supporting schools and districts uh, through this work. And really the book wasn't to like become this best-selling author. It was to make sure that the things that we were doing didn't get trapped in the little school district in St. Louis, that we really released those out to the public for them to think about and iterate on and make it even better. And one of the things that was fun about reading the book um, when it was first given to me was I was just sort of expecting a regular book. There was just going to be lots of words on the page. Um, probably more of like how my five-year-old looks at books that I read. And he's like, where are the pictures, mom? And I love that this one has the pictures and you guys do some interesting things with layout. You give lots of examples um, that using the space of the book itself was um, certainly made it more pleasurable to read. Um, I'm curious to know, because I know that a big part of the book is about getting student feedback, student input, student as co-designer. What was the process that you used? I know you said in the book that, well, it's different with every school and every teacher, but I'm curious to know a little bit more about your process of making students co-designers of the space. Yeah, and, and really the book was by intention. And I think since the book was published four years ago, there's a, a kind of a big pu- push about what is intentional design, not decoration, right? But what is intentionality around the work? So we wanted to make sure the pages of the book felt intentional. We wanted to make sure that a teacher could take the book home on a Friday, look through it and be inspired for Monday. Mm-hmm. Uh, we all have piles of education books all over the place that we never get to. Uh, <laughs> we didn't want to be another. Uh, and then we were also inspired by someone like Austin Kleon. So I don't know if you know Austin Kleon's work. He wrote a book called Steal Like an Artist, but the book was square, big design, big ideas, very joyful. And so um, not only will this book be that way, but the uh, follow-up to that book, which is due out in 2020, will also have that same layout and feel. And really for us, it was about that same design thinking process, like who are the folks we should be empathizing with? And so we spent a lot of time early on talking to students, observing classrooms, and listening, um, just as you would in any other design process. And now we're encouraging schools to all have student design teams Mm -hmm. as a part of their process. And that's been really healthy for me to work with the student design team, but also for teachers to listen 
and have a formal process to listen to students about the space. Uh, that whole idea of uh, students helping you design the space is just fascinating to me. And uh, that's certainly something new that I've heard about this conversation. You know, some of these things I've heard before, like, you know, flexible spaces and, you know, but that part of it was definitely one of the new things that came to light. Um, uh, and I'm just wondering, what, what have you found that students bring to the table that perhaps um, uh, teachers miss or, you know, teachers uh, don't see? Yeah, you know, I think we're locked in as adults. We have habits, we have mental models, we have ways that it's supposed to be. And it's hard for us, even when we are intentional, to break out of those. Mm -hmm. And the students bring this amazing amateur mind, right? Like they aren't blocked by those things. And so they see things differently. Um, they aren't constrained by systems and structures. Mm -hmm. And so they bring the wackiest, most bizarre solutions to the table, but they also move us off of our kind of inertia. And so it's been great to experience that in a number of different schools. Yeah. And I noticed you, you, you talk about the, our current uh, setup with individual desks being perfect for the worksheet. Uh, and, yes. uh, you know, I, I just love that. And I, that sort of was a touch. You know, I'm a math teacher, right? So uh, that's definitely, a, you know, a, a challenge. And that brings me to actually, um, I felt like this book almost was not about space, but is actually about good teaching and learning. Shh, don't tell anybody. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. It's the, the, it's the Trojan the horse. It's the Trojan horse. Um, and I really do tell people that, that this really is about sinking instructional practices mm -hmm. with the learning environment. And, you know, we've spent a lot of time in education talking about and debating in good ways, like what should kids learn, right? And then how should kids learn it? Should they discover it? Should they construct it? Should they, how long should a curriculum be? Mm -hmm. And we've left out like where, right? We've talked about how, we've talked about what, but we left out where. And so like, how do we bring all that together is a beautiful conversation and um, it's been a lot of fun to be a part of that. But absolutely, people want to talk about their space and then once you go there, there's no way not to talk about instruction. <laughs> yeah, one of my um, favorite quotes from the book was, if you really want to shift a culture, it's two things, it's habits and it's habitats, the habits of mind and the physical environment in which people operate. Yeah, we know where we're comfortable. We know where we're inspired, right? And so um, when you want to take people to feel alive, you don't take them to a cemetery, right? Like, And so where do we take kids to feel alive in their learning uh, matters. And so we've been in schools. We've been in a classroom where you're like, as soon as you walk in, the energy drains out of your body. And as soon as you walk in, you're like, oh, this is interesting. And this is happening to kids all over the country right now in this moment on the first day of school. They're either walking in going, wow, this could be great. Or they're going, oh, I have to be in here all year. And so um, it's just essential. And um, I don't know why it slipped off of the radar. Uh, but um, it's been fun to bring it back into the conversation. Mm -hmm. So when you walk into a, uh, a space or a new school uh, or you visit somewhere, um, what is it when you walk into a room and you're like, okay, this is a great learning environment? What, what are the things that stick out right away? Yeah, there's some beauty, right? And I think that kids deserve to be in beautiful spaces. And that doesn't mean that it, you know... Um, I mean, that's just like, a, like art and artifacts being a part of what is on walls and in hallways and in entryways. Um, when I see pictures of kids doing the learning mm -hmm. throughout the school, that inspires me because I think it tells a nonverbal story mm -hmm. of the school. You know, if you go into schools at seven, eight o'clock at night and you can still tell what goes on during the day. That's fantastic. And then there's just a coherence, right? People have been thoughtful about like the color and where things are and there's not just piles of things everywhere. So <laughs> it's, it's a sense that the, not, the open space is also by design. Mm -hmm. I think oftentimes we think about how do we design with the stuff, but how do we also design the open space with an intentional effort? And so I, all those elements kind of bring a feeling about. So sometimes it's hard to create a laundry list, 
uh, it really is a feeling, but there certainly are elements that work for 80% of folks. And let's say there's a, there's a, a, a teacher watching this or listening to this and they're thinking, um, you know what, I kind of like my traditional space and I like the maybe sort of home away from home feel about some of the things on the wall and, uh, you know, what, what might you say to them to uh, encourage them to reflect on their space? Yeah, and the one thing I, I want to make sure is that the, the adults that work in the space need to feel comfortable there as well. Um, there, there can't be a, a martyrdom around this work. Like, mm-hmm. I hate my learning space, but I'm going to do it for the kids. Mm-hmm. And so that's first and foremost. But, um, you know, the research is really clear. And I think that, you know, this is a compelling point that visually noisy spaces mm-hmm. – don't support engagement and satisfaction. And I think that uh, our best chance of kids being academically successful is if they're in a space that's engaging and joyful. And so I think you have to kind of pull that card at times and say that that's a piece of the puzzle. The second thing is continue to ask kids, right? Like, let's ask kids, hey, look around the room. What's new in the room? And if kids start naming things that have been there for months (laughs) – then you know it's a distraction. Uh Um, And then I I rarely go into a classroom in America that couldn't remove 10 things. And it's really hard to envision what might be when nothing's changed. So sometimes you almost have to remove things to envision what's possible. Yeah. Um, And so I would just encourage folks to do those things, even if they're not ready to throw things away. uh, There is a need to kind of at least break the momentum and tradition so you can least envision what might be next. Mm-hmm. It's funny. Um, so our high school, there is a wing that just went through this and we sort of conmarried our classrooms and yes. we got, you know, we threw out a lot of stuff. We took everything down. We have fresh coats of paint, beautiful ceilings, beautiful flooring. Um, and I think, we've been much more intentional about what we're putting back on the walls, what we're not putting back on the walls. So um, I think everything that you're saying really is, couldn't be more perfect timing um, for much of what the upper school teachers and upper school students are going through right now. Yeah, it's been great. And and for, and I don't want things to be stark. And so that's the other thing. Some people like librarians think I'm coming to steal their books. <laughs> Teachers kind of think I'm coming to steal their desk. And and I'm not someone that wants a stark place, but it just a coherence is a big deal, right? And rarely is there a coherent classroom that's evolved over time. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. time isn't uh, a friend to coherence. Right. And we know this. Right. Like imagine a curriculum that was written by one person. That person leaves. Another person implements it. They add something on. They don't remember what the last person. So even things like curriculum design, time is not a friend to coherence. And so um, I think we have to push back against that. But um, it is a liberating thing when schools finally say, like, we're going to we're going to let go of some of this and we're going to and we're going to try something different so that's great to hear how do you uh, uh over time cuz you know we can't stop it uh over time how do you do you have any tips for preventing that that sort of uh incoherence developing yeah you know an uh, easy thing is that i encourage teachers like every monday morning to like look at one wall of their classroom and just ask themselves for 45 seconds, does everything up there support learning? Mm. Right. And if you can take any amount of time just to look and do that once a week, Mm -hmm. like you can't do the whole room, you can't like overhaul your entire space, but like, could you at least evaluate one wall a week? Uh, It keeps it fresh. It keeps it moving. Um, But then also we have to get into other spaces and get people into our spaces, right? We have to, a lot of folks don't make change because they don't know what they don't know. Yeah. So how do we get educators into more buildings where either things are good or bad, there's something to be learned from all of that. And then also some critical friends work where uh, people are coming into other people's rooms and just asking questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why is that poster there? How is that helping? And if there's a good answer, 
professionals know the answers, right? Like some people, I haven't really thought about that. You're probably right. And some people say, well, that helps with this unit and kids really anchor to that image. Great. Mm. Um, but if we aren't asking each other those questions, um, you know, the, the hard part of the work takes over, uh, being in front of kids and having design lessons and call parents and all of that, the urgent gets in the way of the significant. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm just wondering if it's, um, we've introduced uh, sort of, um, uh, peer observations, uh, uh, recently and uh, sort of in a more official capacity. I, I'm wondering, is it useful to, uh, have a space to comment about each other's spaces? Uh, in in a peer evaluation, I, I I think so. I'm you know I'm certainly one that knows that evaluation gets in the way of change, mm-hmm. um, and so I I hate to think that it's part of a super you know a supervisory sort of thing, but a peer to peer, yeah, uh, two well, or three observation qu- yeah. and evaluation, yeah. yeah. So like two or two or three questions that um, allow for people to ask questions about the building principles mm-hmm. around space, and you know those could be. We want to make sure that kids have access to writable space. We want to make sure there's less in our room this year than there was last year. We want to make sure that the images and the bulletin boards and the displays of student work are excellent and have certain elements to them. And so there are two or three things that um, would be easy lift for folks to continue to ask each other about. Uh Much of what we've talked about and and much of what the book is about um, is designing a classroom space. What about once you go out into the halls? What do you think about hallway space in schools? Look at you just segueing into number book number two, right? Uh, Is that what I just did? Yeah, so this this has been the question, right? Like, So classroom teachers around the country have said, we get it. And there are lots and lots of classroom teachers that get it, feel the power of it, and their students experience it. And they say, we're plateaued, though, because this is not a building initiative. It's a classroom initiative. So how do we think about the entryway of the building, the office spaces, the hallways, the libraries, the common spaces? Um, And so, um, yeah, so we're thinking about that next. So in most schools, not in California, but in most schools, a third of all of the square feet of a school is hallway space. And so there's no way we can just leave that to circumstance, right? We have to be intentional about that. So I really tell, I help schools with three things with hallways is that like, what are the static displays that you want to have up for the next five years, right? Mm -hmm. That have logos, that have mission, that have all of those things that are really important to build brand and to build environment and culture. How do you want to think about dynamic displays? Mm -hmm. Uh, that change monthly that, you know, showcase student work and hard work or whatever. And then how do you use digital display and how do you use that? And then the, the fourth part of that is like art and artifacts and beauty. And then there's also a piece about, um, giving kids hands on opportunities in hallways. And I've seen some amazing things from K to 12, uh, that schools are doing to make sure that hallways actually feel like, places where kids are interacting with the space, Uh uh, more museum-like, if you would. And so uh, there's a lot to be done there. And I would say that's a big area of opportunity for most schools. No one's really knocking it out of the park yet. Uh Can you give us an example of an interactive display that you've seen? Yeah, so uh, at St. Saint, Saint Vrain Valley School District in Colorado, uh, they're doing some amazing things. They have it set up where kids have some uh, science experiment work in these little nooks and crannies in the hall where whether it's a marble run or they're figuring out inertia or momentum or uh, simple machines, they have like these little uh, nooks in their hallways that uh, kids can go and interact with those. And there's prompts and – there's a sign and it shows kids how to use it, uh, but it's not. It's one of those informal spaces. It's not like kids get a sign there as a station. Uh, it's kids can interact with that for ten or fifteen seconds in the hallway. Uh-huh. And then I work with their occupational therapists who are also really thinking deeply about um, how uh, kids' vestibular um, issues, where they need to reorient themselves. They need sensory things in the hallway. So we're putting up carpet. We're putting up. Um, like tin roof material where kids can run their hands down that. Um, Yeah. And so 
lots of things that say like, here's a need and we know that this helps. And oftentimes we're taking things out of special education or autism education and realizing a lot of that uh, is good for all kids. Mm -hmm. And we're bringing that out into the hallways to kind of normalize some of that as well. I I love that idea. I know um, toward the end of the book, when you talk about museums and museum spaces, you talk about how, you know, it's a good museum if when you leave, you wanted to touch at least one thing, right? That we're, we're tactile beings. And so I love that idea of having more interactive spaces and hallways. And I feel like students would feel a little bit more like it's theirs rather than, well, the adults are kind of putting stuff up on the hallway walls um, that the interaction is really there for them. Yeah. And, you know, I've seen this over and over when we have uh, turned over hallway spaces to students as design challenges. Mm -hmm. So we've done this in a couple of schools where we say, like, identify the place in the school where you would never want to hang out. (laughs) Why? Right. And what could it be? And so we've had fifth graders in elementary schools that have that's been like they're going away work to the school. Like, hey, when we leave, we want to make sure these spaces are better. And they've designed those. I worked at an upper school in Maryland where um, they the students were like, we don't use the lockers. Why are there lockers here? This would be better off if we did X. Uh-huh. And we didn't implement everything and it, we didn't like cost overrun. But like it was so cool to take little micro environments of the hallway and just turn them over to kids and worked at a school in Pennsylvania where they had kids that hung out in the hallway in the morning. And the principal said, well, at least if you hang out there, you should make it look nice. And so the kids ended up on CAD and did an engineering project and built a deck in the middle of their hallway. It's an amazing project, (laughs) but turn it over to the kids, right? And they will come up with some things to revolutionize our hallways. Yeah. And we have an amazing fine arts department, and I know they've done some of that with some spaces in the upper school where they kind of reinvented the purpose of the space and they created benches and, and things like that for to make it more comfortable for kids to hang out. They've painted certain walls and certain hallways and everything, and I completely agree. I think it's amazing. Yeah, we had a, a project where, um, you know, ceiling tiles, they're pretty standard. You walk by them every day. They're above your head right now. And uh, somebody did a project called People You Look Up To, and they were all painted with heroes. And so all kinds of heroes, right? Like every shade, every color, very diverse. Uh, But there was a whole hallway that became People You Look Up To, and they were painted on the ceiling tiles. And it was just an amazing way to transform the space. That's awesome. I'm pretty excited. Uh, Even today, I'm running a design thinking simulation with my sixth graders. And um, after reading this, we're actually going to talk about the use of space in this building. So um, I'm pretty excited about that. I'm looking forward to it. Um, now, it, we've touched on this a little bit already, but uh, it seems that this this whole idea of rethinking space is very multifaceted. And um, uh, you've talked a bit about sort of um, the mindfulness side of things and, uh, you know, having having things in the hallway um, for, for people to uh, interact with. Um, I, I noticed you also mentioned um, it, there's a section on seven principles of universal design, uh, and one of those is um, equitable use. Um, can you say a little bit about what uh, what that means and, and how we can design spaces um, to be equitable? Yeah, and again, uh, it, it could be unpacked right here. I think that when we think of equity, we wanted to make sure that we provided ideas in the book that could be used by schools across the country. Mm -hmm. So where where you guys are, let's make sure that folks in Fishers and Zionsville and all the independent schools and all of Indianapolis public schools, like there are things in there that didn't create another gap. You didn't have to have Mm -hmm. a capital campaign or a bond issue to do some of this work. So Mm -hmm. to us, part of that is the equitable space piece. Mm -hmm. But it's also about making sure that all of our kids with differences feel comfortable in more of the spaces in the building. Mm -hmm. And um, that sometimes has to do with lighting and sometimes has to do with choice and ownership of spaces. So that part feels there as well. Um, But then also making sure that um, there's a level of flexibility that everyone felt like no one owned a space. I mean, I think we get Mm -hmm. caught in this trap that we, even we make this mistake of like putting teachers names on the door 
So you might as well tell them they own that space, uh-huh. Uh-huh. right? Like if it's Mrs. Jones's room, we say this out loud, right? That means they own it. That means the students don't own it. That means another teacher can't really come in there. That means a co-teacher in that room doesn't feel like an equitable use of that space. And so sometimes it's just the language we use with spaces start to exclude people feeling like they can make change in ownership. So it, it really is pretty multifaceted. Yeah. And, and how does uh, uh, how do schools have conversations about this? Uh, how do they actually uh, move forward to, I mean, that sounds, uh, on the surface to some teachers, it might sound like, fairly sort of progressive and out there. Um, yeah. Uh, how, do, how do we take baby steps? Uh, how do we go to, to step one um, before we get to 10? Yeah. So um, whatever that looks like, grade level, teams, departments, kind of coming up with a common set of principles that says we are all pursuing that in these spaces mm-hmm. uh, starts to include more teachers in the conversation. So that's an easy starting point. Um, I think another one of those starting points is starting with a really small micro environment somewhere mm-hmm. that more people can feel a sense of ownership. It could be a old conference room. It could be a technology lab. It can be kind of this leftover space that no one really knew what to do with, that no one really has ownership of, that yeah. we can practice common ownership that way. Mm-hmm. Um, I was in a, a conference room that looked like a curriculum museum. You know, there were 50 years worth of books that are no longer being used and 74 different types of chairs in the room. Um, Just giving adults a chance to practice kind of working on a common project together Uh is another piece of that puzzle. Uh So you're kind of saying the the conversations, the pedagogy comes first, the collaboration comes first, and then the need comes out of that. Am I hearing you right? I think so. And the other piece is this identifying the verbs of a space, right? And that's Mm -hmm. core to the book is that if we can identify what's supposed to happen in there, um, then the conversation isn't about a person. Mm -hmm. It's about the actions that students are supposed to take in there. So it's not about the teaching actions. It's about the learning actions. And I've seen teachers start to put those verbs up on the walls and have conversations and debrief with kids about them. And it's a big shift Mm -hmm. uh, because that's what's supposed to happen in there. And it doesn't matter who's in there. If we're supposed to discover and explore, collaborate, then we can do that together. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes that creates a common language for a space as well and kind of uh, rolls back some of that ownership and fiefdomness that happens in classrooms and um uh we are coming to the end of our time here but i I just wanted to uh ask maybe one more question just about um a possible book three for you uh and that is uh outdoor space uh we you know we have a fair amount of it here and um i would say right now there's um it's used for various things but the potential is huge um uh, what would you recommend uh, in terms of how to, to apply these principles to outside spaces? Oh, I think it's more important than ever, right? We have students that um, aren't getting outdoors. Their balance between green time and screen time isn't what it needs to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and so certainly it's regional, and depending on where you are in the country, it's easier to have more months and more days outside. Uh, But I have seen amazing outdoor classrooms and things that do teamwork and low ropes courses and gardens. And there are models of how that works around the country. And even that expeditionary learning model that we started the conversation about where we're getting kids into the community so they're seen as assets Mm -hmm. and not liabilities. Uh Because as our communities oftentimes see our kids as liabilities, like we have to take care of them. They can mess up our parks. They litter on our streets. They write. And when we can make a shift to where kids are seen as assets because of their amateur mind, because of their community service, because of their contributions, it really does begin to shift the mental model of what people have of the youth and schools and our role in teaching and learning. And so, uh, yeah, it plays a big part and I'm an outdoors person. I, I can't get outside enough. And so, um, there you have it. Book three in the making. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Robert Dillon, thank you so much for joining us on thank this you. episode.
yeah, it's been great to be here and uh, wishing you guys a great school year and uh, uh, keep thinking about the space because it matters. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was Dr. Robert Dillon, co-author of The Space, A Guide for Educators. We hope you enjoyed the episode. And if you haven't yet, do subscribe uh, using the links on the YouTube video or on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Also, if you love season one or you just enjoyed today's episode, uh, do go ahead and leave us a review on iTunes. See you next time.